Hey everybody, it's John Buck back with another discrete time linear systems video. Uh, in this one, we're going to do an inverse Fourier transform example. We're going to show you if I start with a rectangular pulse and frequency, how do I take the inverse transform of that to get the time domain signal uh, that corresponds to it? What kind of signal in time has a Fourier transform that's just a rectangular pulse and frequency? Uh, so that's today's example. So uh, switching over to the whiteboard, again, I'm looking, in this case, I'm doing it from uh, something that's a, a, a low frequency, Fourier transform, we would sometimes call this a, a low pass transform or a band limited transform between minus pi over 2 and plus pi over 2. And I'm just going to start directly from my Fourier synthesis equation. So it's 1 over 2 pi, the integral from minus pi to pi of x of e to the j omega, e to the j omega n d omega. And so the first thing I would do to look at this and say, well, from minus, you know, if I maybe I use color here to indicate, this region is zero and this region is zero. So the same way we often use the unit step to get, we can simplify the limits of a sum, we can simplify the limits of this integral because we say the integral is going to be zero outside of pi over two to minus pi over two. And, and even further, we can simplify it more because inside that region, it would be one. And so inside from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, I have x of e to the j omega becomes just 1 times e to the j omega n. And so this is a, a, a convenient integral, right? An integral of e to the j omega n d omega becomes 1 over j n, right, from the chain rule. I need to bring that down from the denominator. 1 over j n times e to the j omega n. And then it's a definite integral, so I'm evaluating it at pi over 2 and minus pi over 2. All right, so now I bring all these together out front. I have 1 over uh, j 2 pi n. And then when I plug this in, I'll have e to the j. Right, I substitute for omega because I was integrating with respect for omega. Be careful that I'm substituting for omega, not n. Sometimes students, when they're first doing these, mess that up. But remember the integral with respect to omega. So I plug in plus omega over 2, minus omega over 2. And hey, look at that. That is our old friend from Euler of, well, it's an exponential minus an exponential with the opposite sign means what I have in the parentheses is 2 times, or 2j times the sine of pi by 2 times n. I'm looking at this, I say, oh, and in fact, I can cancel the j's, and I can cancel the 2's. And when I sort of simplify all that and get it together, I have 1 over pi n, I'll leave the, the sign in the numerator. I have sine of pi over 2 times n over pi n. And so this is, what, this is, again, another example. This is what we call a classic sinc function because it's a sine, over, sine of n over n, something that's a fine, sine of n over n. It's got a, the extra pi's in it. But the basic functional form, the dependency, is this. So the, the numerator is just oscillating. The denominator is growing. So it's going to sort of, as I go to larger and larger n, I have this oscillating function that's going to die down more and more. So let's uh, look quickly at, at what that looks like. So sine of pi over 2n over pi n. Well, like I said, the numerator is, is, is going to go at, at 0. This is 0. At n equals 1, it's 1. But then the denominator at n equals 1 would be pi. So at, at n equals 1, I have a 1 over pi and then uh, 0, and then I'll have uh, the numerator at 3 pi over 2 is minus 1. So I have minus 1 over 3 pi, and then at 4, it's 0 again. And this is uh, turns out to be symmetric in n when I plug them in, because both numerator and denominator become negative for negative n, and so that sort of balances it, it out. So I have 1 over pi. And the only tricky point I, I should have said we'll come back to it is at 0, because at 0, I have at 0 on the numerator and the denominator. So I need to use uh, Le Hopital's rule. I 
which you might need to go review from calculus if you're not familiar, uh, which, which says that the, uh, the integral there will be, uh, uh, well, I take the derivative of the numerator with respect to n, I get a pi over 2 cosine pi over 2n. Take the derivative of the denominator with respect to n, and I just get a pi, and then I evaluate this at n equals 0 again. Well, now this becomes 1, so I have pi over 2 and pi. These cancel, and I have a half. So it would be at, at zero, sort of roughly to scale, it will be height one half. And outside of that, it will be this thing that sort of go, uh, switches between zero plus positive negative. But the further out I go, the smaller they get, because these are getting bigger and bigger in the denominator. I have one over five pi minus one over seven pi, so that's even a little less than one twentieth. Uh, so this is not even really well drawn to scale, because things are dying off faster than I'm really showing it here. All right, but just to give you a rough sense, depending on what this, this frequency, this omega is in the middle, they may oscillate uh, longer or, or uh, they may have different period, right? If oh, this was smaller than pi over 2, I'd, I'd be broader in frequency. And that fits a, an overriding theme we see in Fourier transforms, that, that if, if this were smaller, it would mean going back two pages. Or just one page. Right, if I picked a, something smaller than pi over 2, this would be narrower in frequency. And that turns out that would make this thing grow or, or be wider in time. So when I squeeze things into smaller and smaller frequencies, they happen more smoothly and spread out in time. That's a common uh, concept we should get used to seeing. OK, so there's a, a quick example of, of one way to compute an inverse Fourier transform when your signal uh, is in the frequency side is a rectangular pulse. That's all for this time. I'll uh, see you at the next video.